Right. Now, if that didn't wake you up, I'm not sure what will. Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to day three of InnoTribe, where the theme is the future of money and the future of currency. So my name is James Lloyd. I'm the Asia Pacific FinTech and Payments Leader at EY, based in Hong Kong. And in fact, it has been quite an honor to be involved in InnoTribe these past six years, I believe. Uh, I have participated as a startup, as a growth stage innovator, and since, and as advisor. But actually, it's a particular honor to host today's session. So this is the flagship InnoTribe session around the future of money. We have a very illustrious panel of global experts to opine on all things future of money and currency, from Bitcoin to Libra, from US dollar dominance to the forthcoming Chinese central bank issued digital currency, and of course, everything in between. Now before that, before we dive into the future of money, I wanted to spend just a couple minutes talking about the history of money. You know, as per that phenomenal intro video, I think there's a little bit we can take from the history of money and how the evolution of financial services perhaps might suggest the way things are headed over the next 5, 10, 20 years. So, the history of money is the history of humanity. Well, what do I mean by that? Let me take you back. Hunter-gatherers had no need for money. Each band of hunter-gatherers hunted, gathered, and manufactured almost everything they needed. Of course, certain individuals within the band may have specialized in certain tasks, but they would share their outputs with the rest of the band in an economy of mutual favors and obligations. In effect, each band was economically self-sufficient, where they, in the, in the kind of rare cases where items weren't available locally, they would trade through simple barter with other bands. And in fact, not much changed with the agricultural revolution. Most people continued to live in small, intimate communities. Again, villages were typically self-sufficient economic units. Again, an economy of mutual favors and obligations prevailed, and where, again, those rare instances you required something from a, a corresponding village, then simple barter would suffice. It was only really with the rise of cities and kingdoms, of course, themselves a consequence of improved transport infrastructure, that brought about opportunities for specialization. As we all know, living in a city provides opportunities for full-time employment, better or worse. Villages began to realize, gosh, actually it might be beneficial for me to specialize in certain products and services and then trade with my neighbors. But specialization created a problem. Densely, uh, how to manage the exchange of goods and services between strangers. Actually, the mutual favors and obligations that we had seen both with hunter-gatherers and the agricultural revolution, didn't work with such a large number of strangers. Simple barter doesn't work when you've got such a complex range of products and services. So some societies tried to solve for this by establishing a central barter system. But actually, most societies found a better way. They invented money. So what is money precisely? And again, I want to get into this as we think through the future of money, just thinking about its history and thinking about its nature, and as I said, how that might suggest where things are headed. Of course, money is a concept. It was created many times in many places. You know, the theme today is the future of money and the future of currency, but currency, of course, is really a subset of money. Currency is a system of money in common use within a particular jurisdiction. So it might be the British pound, of course, or it actually might be your preloaded Oyster card which Swift have generously provided to each of us. But actually, in effect, money is a much broader topic. It's anything that people are willing to use in order to systematically represent the value of other things for the purpose of exchanging goods and services. Now, this seems like a simple thing. Why is he talking about what money is? Actually, I think it's quite important as we think through some of the technological developments coming down the tracks. So to reiterate, money enables people to quickly and easily compare the value of different commodities. You should all remember this from economics class. To easily exchange one thing for another and to store wealth conveniently. So why am I focusing on this definition? Well, I think it's important if we consider 
I'm sure you've all read Sapiens, or at least a large portion of you have. If you think of Professor Yuval Noah Harari's definition of money, and I strongly recommend you do, what's important here is if we think about the development of money required no technological breakthroughs. It was a purely mental revolution. It involved the creation of a new intersubjective reality that exists solely in people's shared imagination. OK, so what does that mean? Simply put, you believe in money because you believe that other people believe in money. <laughs> so please feel free to donate your Oyster card to me on the way out. No, I, um, I, I think the point I'm raising here and again, this will become increasingly relevant as we think about cryptocurrencies, as, as we think about central bank issued digital currencies, et cetera, is that money as a concept is a system of mutual trust. I call it a system of collective self-delusion, but let's call it a system of mutual trust. In fact, it is the most universal and most efficient system of mutual trust ever devised. I mentioned currency earlier. Currency is a, is a system of money. It's a subset. So when we think about money, we often think about coins and banknotes. But of course, they are already a rare form of money. There's a lot of talk these days about the end of cash, etc. Believe me, the end of cash has already happened. It's just unevenly distributed. Cash, banknotes, coins are a very rare form of money as they exist today. As you know, as Swift knows, most transactions involve moving electronic data around. So again, as we think about the concepts of money, is this so different to what's existed before? And in fact, so long as people are willing to trade goods and services in exchange for electronic data, it's actually better than banknotes. It's lighter, it's less bulky, it's easier to keep track of, although we'll come back to whether that's necessarily a pure benefit. But importantly, without money, commercial networks and markets would have remained very limited in size, complexity, and dynamism. Our globalized world would not be possible without money. And as we think about the political developments happening, not just here in the UK, not just in Hong Kong where I live, but all over the world, I think we need to think about money as part of that globalized story and what impact might changes in the political and economic landscape herald. OK, so what does this present state tell us about the future? Well, this is the point of our panel today. We live in interesting times. We live in times of negative interest rates and seemingly unending quantitative easing. We live in the world of Bitcoin, which was designed in part to guard against inflation. We live in the world of Libra, at least conceptually, which in part has been pitched as a means to solve for 1.7 billion of the world's population who are unbanked, i.e. without access to the formal bank, uh, without uh, access to the formal financial services system. And of course, Libra is itself being repositioned somewhat as a defensive mechanism to China's rise in terms of fintech innovation and adoption. Of course, in China itself, you may be aware that the People's Bank of China, the central bank, is in the final stages of developing and soon to issue a central bank, a central bank issued digital currency, a CBDC. Even here in the UK, the governor of the Bank of England, Mark Carney, recently spoke about how a new synthetic hegemonic currency could conceivably emerge to dampen the domineering influence of the US dollar on global trade backed in part by a series of central bank-issued digital currencies. So again, these are interesting times. I think as we reflect upon the history of money and the nature of money, I want to bring some of that thinking into our panel discussion around the future as we consider what is different about today and how might that impact things in five, ten years' time. Is it a question of complexity? Is the world much more complex today? Is it a question of security? As we think about electronic money, how do we think about security and identity? Is it a question of scale or network effects? Is the difference today that a Libra or a PBOC coin can effectively provide a transnational currency with the flick of a switch? 
So these are all the topics I want to discuss today. That was my own brief intro. To help us think through some of this, again, I would like to welcome to the stage our illustrious panel. Great. Now, I said illustrious and I meant it. This is quite the, uh, quite the gathering for, for a Wednesday morning. Um, I'm not going to attempt to do introductions for you. So if you wouldn't mind, uh, if we start perhaps with Scarlett, if we just go down the line here for an introduction in terms of, in terms of what you're at, where you're based, and then we'll take it from there. Sure. Uh, based in New York, but really on a plane. Um, and I am a managing director at CCG. So at CCG, we are a global consulting firm that really specializes on strategy and digital and innovation implementation, looking at things like talent, technology, and culture, and really trying to distinguish ourselves there. And then more broadly, thinking about how banks and fintech can come together in the fusion of those two things. Excellent. Michael. Thanks, James. Good morning. I'm Michael Moon. I, I live in Singapore. I work for Swift, and we, we put on this, um, this production, of course, which is fantastic to see everybody here. Uh, my, my job is uh, I, I lead payments, trade, and marketing communications across the Asia-Pacific region, and really we're about identifying problems that exist at scale in the financial industry, and you could characterize our core mission as helping the financial industry strip friction out of, out of the industry. So I'm very, very focused on that at, at an Asia-Pacific context. Excellent. Lita. I'm Lita Glyptis. I'm based here in London. I am the CEO of 11FS Foundry, a cloud-based core banking system. Um, when not on this panel, all I want to talk about is banking as a service, but I will try to keep it as limited as possible. Um, I am a recovering banker, so um, it's nice to be here uh, on the other side today. Excellent. Tony, uh, we're, by the way, we're in your aquarium. Tony Fish, this yeah. is a fitting. It is. Gosh, that joke uh, so, is uh, awesome. I, And I'm going to say thank you to Innes uh, for, uh, he knows that I'm quite nervous at this sort of event. So he's one put me with a family on stage, and then he's surrounded with my family. And it's, it's, I'm very <laughs> humbled. Thank you very much. Um, one thing that you should know about fish is obviously um, dead fish are the ones that go with the flow. They're the ones that go with the current. Uh, and what makes this fish alive is to go against the current and flow against what else gets said, just so you're there. Uh, so I'm an investor, I'm an author, and I'm a maverick. Uh, I also happen to sit on the board of a bank, and I chair probably the first reporting committee, proper reporting committee, uh, for data ethics and privacy. Um, so I have a particular interest in governance, and I've just spent a year uh, on sabbatical, reading 52 books, uh, and a lot of them around governance. So thank you for, for allowing me to be here. Excellent. And as Lita says, this is a bit of a family. I've known each, each of you for, for many years, so it's, a, it's quite, quite the gathering. And in fact, we've got quite a geographic spread as well, from the Americas to Asia Pacific to Europe, and I guess quite recently Australasia as well. Uh, starting off, I mean, this is a session on the future of money, and I think um, between Dave Birch and Brett King, they're going to be covering off the kind of sci-fi elements of this tomorrow, a hundred years hence. I think for us, we're a little bit more grounded. We're thinking next five, ten years. Scarlett, maybe starting with you, like what, what, what are you seeing in the Americas in your, in your role today that you think is a, a kind of a hot topic in terms of the future of money that could really have an influence on how things are headed? Yeah, I think we don't even need to necessarily look five years from now, and we can't really talk about the future of money without talking about what's happening um, from the banking side in the United States. In the last 10 years, we have seen mass con consolidation in the United States in the banking system, down almost 34%. And if you think about even this last year in 2019, we are losing almost a bank a day. At this rate, we're at almost 200. And so that has a huge impact, not just on the banking system itself, so we're now around 5,000 institutions, which you know, not too long ago we were much more, but then the economy and the, the heart of, in this case, the United States, which is our small businesses, because these are the smaller banks are the one that has really been best at servicing them, whereas the big banks, there's a lot of reasons as to why they're, they're not doing that. So I think if we start there and see, ha and see what will happen there and the impact it has on small businesses, well, that will have a big impact on what's happening in the future of money more broadly. And I'd say the second biggest thing is really identity and democratization of data, because Banks, fintechs, you name it, everyone is finding different ways to take information, 
new information and finding ways to service customers better and customers are now having uh, an opportunity in many cases to control their own data. So I'd say those two things are key for me. Maybe just staying on this for a moment, it, it, uh, do we think the U.S. is likely to lead in, in, in any of these regards? I mean, I would say probably sitting in Asia at least, we would look at some of the fintech centers as of course being China, you know, UK and London, et cetera. It, it, in terms of problems to be solved, do we anticipate the U.S. is going to be positioning itself in relation to, you know, Fed coin, central bank um, issued digital currencies, et cetera? Or is that likely to happen elsewhere? I think there's certainly the opportunity. Uh, one of the challenges in the United States is how, I mean, we, this is not only a U.S. problem, but the complexity of our government and all of the different bodies who really have a, a control, a governing bodies who have a control and say there. Uh, there, there is progress. There's, the CFPB just announced some stuff in the last 10 days about what they're doing on and really trying to move forward that, that fintech side. Of course, we're seeing charters now in the U.S., which is which was quite new. Um, I will say that other parts of the world are certainly uh, more advanced than we are. Yeah. But we have other problems that we're thinking about too. I was sitting with a, a group from Europe in New York just 10 days ago, and they were talking about how weird it was to go to restaurants in New York and have to pay cash. Um, and that's still cash. I mean, we're talking about the future of money. In the United States, cash is, not, I'm not going to go as extreme to say is still king, but is having a huge impact. The Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco just did a survey, and 26 of all transactions in, on the Western Hemisphere uh, within the United States was still cash. And by the way, the number one um, user of this, people under 25, with 34% wow. of their transactions um, through cash. So. That's very different than where we are here. And uh, you know, li living there and being able to travel all the world, I'd say it's, it's pretty interesting how there's a lot of advancements that's happening to us, but from a cash perspective, we are still pretty cash heavy. And I don't see that fully going away for quite some time. Definitely not in the next five years. Interesting. I mean, I guess that moves us on, Michael, to, to Asia. I mean, I, you know, definitely talking my own book here, but I do think you know, Asia Pacific is probably where we've seen the most amount of innovation. And, and perhaps it's a consequence of the leapfrog effect in China, et cetera. You're sitting in Singapore. How do you how do you see some of these themes from an APAC perspective, mm. or, or just more broadly? Yeah, a good question. Uh, when I was confronted with this topic of this morning, the future of money, uh, I wasn't quite sure where to start. So I started talking to a few friends and colleagues, and um, one of the more interesting answers I got back uh, from my my colleague in India was the future of money is rupee and renminbi. Uh, <laughs> And so that's a proposition based on these are economies of rapidly growing economic size. Um, they're going to assert that size in a much larger way in future as well. Um, and it's economic size and it's population size and, and people is important in money as well. Um, if you can't trust each other, then you can't exchange, um, whether you're talking about cash or digital money or some, some other form as well. So, you know, I think, I think that's a common theme. Um, within Asia as well. I had a small uh, story here when I arrived in London. Um, a few friends of mine, we went to see a show on Friday night and uh, I bulk booked the ticket on behalf of my colleagues and I had the problem of having to collect the equivalent of about 500 pounds back from my colleagues so I could get, I could get paid. And these are colleagues from all over the region. So my colleague from India, he gave me great written pound cash yeah, and I don't know what to do with that here because it's mostly cashless. Um, you're at about 30% cashless, 30% cash left in the UK. My Singapore-based friends, um, they all use the um, what's called the pay now functionality in Singapore, which is the domestic real-time uh, retail-oriented payment system. They paid based on my Singapore-based mobile number. I got a nice little SMS notification, Michael, you've received the money. Uh, I still have w one more to go. That's my Australian colleague. He hasn't paid me yet. Um, <laughs> they, they have great infrastructure in Australia, by the way, as well. Um, but I don't maintain an Australian mobile number and I don't really use my Australian accounts anymore. So you can sort of see the, the challenge in the picture there. And um, you know, this is to my earlier comment about removing friction from the industry. There's quite a few problems that reside in that kind of scenario. and. Uh, you know, one thing we're very focused on um, and really is at the heart of our vision is to make what we experience in our daily domestic lives from a, a payment experience in these real-time oriented markets, the simplicity, the convenience, the ubiquity of that type of experience to bring that to the cross-border payment experience. Yeah, so that, that's something we're really focused on there as well. 
I mean, I think there's a couple of couple of items there to, to, to draw out, perhaps. I mean, obviously, the internationalization of the RMB has been a, a topic of much discussion for many years now. Um, but, you know, as we sit here today, the US dollar is the de facto global reserve currency. I think it's been very interesting as we consider some of the central bank uh, backed um, initiatives, not least in China, but as I mentioned in the opening, Mark Carney talking about, you know, this synthetic hegemonic currency as perhaps being a means by which the world can wean itself off the US dollar dominance. Now, this is a big topic, but the question for me, I guess, is how much of this is about technology and how much of it is about politics and economics? Is that, a, is that an easy question for you, Lena, or? I was hoping you'd throw this to me and not the mad fish over there. Um, <laughs> your time will come, fish, your time will come. I think it's a very interesting situation we're in because we're talking about money as a construct philosophically with all the challenges that crypto may have brought or may have failed to bring that mm -hmm. we anticipated, held our breath and it hasn't quite happened. Then we're talking separately about access to money, both from an instrument perspective and from a social and political inequality perspective. Yeah. And of course we talk about the, the distribution and processing of money, which is what we all do for a living. <clears throat> There's a technology layer in all of this. And the art of the possible has transformed radically over the years. We know that. We've been afraid of it, we've been excited by it, depending on where we sit and how we make money. I would say the one thing that has definitely changed in the six years since I last did this panel at Cybos is the fact that the people in this room, and I mean all of us, not just you in the audience, don't feel we control the conversation the way we did. Because mm. there has been a, a, a transitional period that has gone on for way too long, but for the first half of it, for the first five, six years of this transformational period, the banking infrastructure, and I will put the regulators in that bucket and, and the decision makers of the globally significant financial institutions, we would get around the table and largely feel we control this conversation about the future of money, the stability, the, the choices we get to make. And the way we looked at technology coming down the path was very much colored by the fact that, okay, some of this is happening to us. There are startups out there bringing new models to the table. The technology itself is not devised by the banks. But fundamentally, we get to make choices about timing, significance, and that is very much not the case, as it turns out. Um, so the why biggest... Do you, why do you say that? What's the change? I think we have seen by now that the pace of change has not actually been dictated by banks, has been dictated more by uh, sizable new entrants mm. and the choices regulators have made, consciously or unconsciously, that had permitted a certain type of business model to flourish. I think looking at what the regulator has done in, say, the Asia-Pacific region sure. versus Europe, um, without seeing which one is, is, is better or worse, the fundamental differences in their approach to the changing ecosystem has actually meant different business models have been viable, yeah. different players have emerged, different propositions have come to the table that have changed our relationship to money, the way we process money, the way we access money, and the financial instruments that become viable or non-viable. So the entire cake mm. changes um, by who's allowed to play, what regulatory frameworks are put in place, what choices are made, what is not talked about consciously or unconsciously. So I think... Um, I'm not suggesting that, hey, we all thought we controlled the narrative and it turns out there was someone else who did. The realization over the last five, six years is we don't. It's a constant conversation and the door is not closed. New entrants are coming in and whether they succeed or fail, they change how we perceive the uses of technology, what's possible, et cetera. I mean, let me, let me, let me stay on that for a little bit. I think that's a really, really interesting perspective. Um, I mean, I, <laughs> at the risk of sounding like a name dropper. I was at a, a, a dinner last night with the author of the Future of Finance report, right? Hugh Van Stienis, who, who, who authored on behalf of Mark Carney here. And one of the points he was making was, actually, it was quite a struggle just to get a UK perspective on all of these developments. To your point, everything is moving so fast. There are many different regulatory and policy making bodies involved in these topics that even just coordinating at a UK level leaving aside political instability and all that, even, <laughs> even coordinating at a UK level is very challenging. But is that the right question? So I, I'm, before I was a lapsed banker, I was a lapsed political scientist, so give me a second here. <laughs> if we're talking about the, the future of money as being coll collective political delusion, then talk about na nationalism and the nation state sure. as a bounded construct, right? If what we do here is move assets and goods across borders seamlessly in real time, well, 
I ideas do that even faster. So one of the most fundamental problems we have is we're trying to fit a new world into vessels that are potentially not fit for purpose. It is hard to get a UK-based idea because I would say that getting a nationally bounded notion of how the world moves forward is is not fit for purpose anymore. No, but this is exactly the point I want to echo. I, 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 I fundamentally agree, um, and of course, being a poli-sci major myself, um, All the I mean, in, 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 chi in China, I mean, the reality of the China development of Alipay, the Alipay ecosystem, Tencent ecosystem, et cetera, I mean, there has been a level of regulatory arbitrage involved. I mean, effectively, large technology players moving laterally into financial services, leveraging the network effects, and I think this is one of the key ch changes in the world today, leveraging the network effects to scale at a rate and pace that frankly left everyone to some degree blindsided. And, and my question here, and I promised I wouldn't get into Libra this early, but I can't, I can't avoid it. It's to coming. your point, Lita, is, you know, w f you know, the Facebook or the Libra announcement appears to have spurred policymakers globally, both at European level, Bank for International Settlements, China, UK, and elsewhere, into responding. So is the future of money likely to be determined, Tony, by private actors with that scale and network effects, or, and, and having regulators scramble to respond, or are we likely to see a coherent, um, I don't know, well thought through response to how money will move and transact in the future? Um, James, uh, so this is a bit like a Sunday lunch where <laughs> half the family's arguing for Brexit and half the family's arguing. That uh, had to be done. The, uh, it's a brilliant question because it unpacks a series of really great issues which Led has already gone to and, and Scarlett as well. Um, there is definitely a short term future of money which you can kind of like see upstairs. And it's really easy to understand which is where you start from, uh, which is there will be more trade. We get that, dead easy, happy days. There will be more entity, because money is entity. You said it, we worship money because money makes money. We get that. Those two things are absolutely upstairs with all the branding, which is around faster, quicker, you know, et cetera, et cetera. We're there. Next two to three years, sorted. It's the next piece, the next five to seven, which becomes quite difficult because of a number of things that come along. One of the things I'm really interested in, next five to seven, is another word that's up there, but it's where you're going, which is this word data. Mm. And data has a series of interesting things that come around, and there's three characteristics data have, which money doesn't have yet, which money's going to adopt. The first characteristic is more accountability and more responsibility, because money's traceable. You talk about Libra, Bitcoin, I know exactly what you've spent, where you've spent it, and who you've done it with. You can't run away, that's coming. And Do you think this hit. is why Swift issued us all with an Oyster card so they can kind of keep tabs Absolutely. on? Absolutely. Okay, great. Yeah. <laughs> Don't worry, we're all tracked. Happy days. <laughs> the other one you used as a word, James, right at the beginning, money has lost the humanity. And one thing that data will bring back is humanity. Because actually, we know about people. You cannot avoid, you have to do the best in, for people. So we're going to get more humanity because we have more data about people. The last one is money becomes programmable. Hmm. So we've got three new characteristics which money doesn't have today. Why has Libra become really interesting? Because banks today, basically regulatory-wise, have are told to look in. Okay, they have a responsibility under KYC, AML, anti fraud They look at your accounts to make sure they know where the money comes from. If you go and talk to Microsoft, Google, um, uh, or Amazon, and your hosting, they're not allowed to look. They're the postal services. They're not allowed to look inside the envelope. So we have a really interesting series of bits coming along, which is we want this thing with data, but who can look inside the envelope? Well, some of the industries are already regulated to look in the envelope. But do we trust those people to look in the envelope, which is where you're going? Yeah. Who are we going to trust to look in the envelope? Because that's where it gets quite scary. If I, if I may just sort of pick up on the, the data, data theme, uh, definitely the, it's a data pervasive future for money. Um, and uh, I'm seeing some interesting little examples of how uh, data is being used in, in transacting and exchanging value. Uh, I came across one yesterday, actually. I was talking to a, a New Zealand customer, and they shared a story about a little fintech in New Zealand um, called CoGo, Connect Good. And um, they're utilizing the open banking framework in New Zealand, whereby a customer that is making a payment to a business 
they're providing consent to their financial institution that um, they're able to, to use a little bit more data that they have, so they're giving that consent. And when the customer transacts with the business, information comes back to the payer that says, you know, you, you just paid $20 to this business. Here is this business's sustainability score. Yeah. yeah? And um, so this connect good idea, yep. I, I really like this um, idea of um, we're working with money how we have it, but we're evolving the services and making use of the data that is out there to actually perform common good or greater public good outcomes as mm. well. So, you know, I don't know where that'll go, but it's a nice little novel idea. Um, I heard another one which is a little bit more commercial, um, and I think this comes back to, to India. Um, somebody with a car, they need to fill up the oil occasionally in the car, and this is to the programmable money idea. They open the hood. Um, there's a little kind of coupon process such that if you fill with the oil of a particular supplier, you'll get re rebated money money back. So it's kind of incentivizing the hmm. you know the customer to keep oil in the car, keep the car running, and there's a little transaction that happens there as well. I, I, I see a future where there's a lot more of this micro transacting aside. I, I don't have a, a strong view on what type of issuance will happen with money, whether it's a crypto or a fiat or different versions, but I certainly see a future where there's a lot more microtransacting happening. But l let, me, let me throw this out. That, so one of, one of the issues that we've been kind of considering, kind of taking both of those points in, in turn is, and the reason I spoke a little bit about the history of money and also that it's frankly just a collective delusion, you know, we all, we all believe in money because you do too, but actually as we move into this data-driven um, paradigm, gosh, I sound like a consultant, a data-driven <laughs> paradigm. Actually, there is intrinsic value in the data. So money is no longer yes. just a collective delusion, but actually there is some utility associated yes. with it. And now my question is, and you know, throw it out to the floor, is what governance model do we think is going to be suitable for managing, maintaining, and monetizing aspects of that data? Is it our current monetary system with a central bank here and a bunch of banks here and you know some peripheral fintechs it's, etc it's a very good question it and it's a it's a very difficult question because there are very there are two fundamental assumptions that we are making one is that there will be an in inevitable transition away from money as a bearer asset mm. but that will become heavily contentious and there will be quite a lot of voices fighting against that as a as a as a possible, possible version of the future, right? And that will be government driven because the final call will be made there, whether it will be at the sort of bank of level or above remains to be seen. But, but the socio-political and control implications of programmable yeah. money versus this, the, the possibility to be off the grid and have just money as a bearer asset that, that doesn't allow for that traceability is an intensely moral question. Yes. And, to the point I was making earlier, the right people are not around the table. Uh, so, so I think we will see that conversation emerging a certain way. The other thing we haven't touched on is that, that money is fundamentally divisive and, and fundamentally unequal. And although the technology exists to provide faster, better, cheaper servicing, financial inclusion is still a small vertical of our world. Access to money and microfinancing is still the sort of thing we say, oh, isn't that nice? Um, but the, the, the capabilities that we have currently from an infrastructure perspective, from a possibility perspective, could actually allow us to retain the profitability to a certain extent of the industry we all live in and, and don't want to see taken away, but actually address the, the fundamental socioeconomic implications of money, yeah. the haves, the have nots, access and no access, being divisive not just because that's the way of the world, but because there was an inability to do things differently for a while. That is no longer there. That is also a moral question. It's not about the can we, it's about how do we rearrange um, the landscape. I don't think we've gotten to the point that we're having the moral question. We're having the practical question. Mm -hmm. What is possible? How does, how does it change the way we do things? That bit is no longer working. Can we patch it? Can we fix it? I think people are bolder in the way they face up to those questions. Um, the intentions are actually getting better and better. I see less cynicism, which is a nice thing, but the fundamental morality underpinning those issues to the introduction you made, I don't think we come to work every morning saying, today we should talk about that 
actually. Well, so, so I want to I want to get a, a view from others in relation to. You mentioned we don't have the right people at the table, but I'm curious as to who those people should be. I mean, is it simply governments? Is it central banks? Is it? I mean, I, I, and, and maybe before we come on to that, my, my second observation on, on what you've said is, I do think it's interesting when I'm in the UK, for example, and people talk about financial inclusion, clearly there are uh, underbanked and to some degree unbanked in the UK. There's clearly issues with, you know, if it's purely digital money, then are you, for example, disadvantaging, you know, perhaps older segments who are more reliant. But actually, you know, we're in our part of the world, and, and especially in parts of Southeast Asia, for example, you could argue it's a moral imperative to get people on the banking grid, mm. uh, on the banking grid, to digitize currency such that you can unleash the power of credit. I mean, one of the one of the Absolutely. one of the key beauties of money, effectively, is credit, right? In so but, we're, but we're we're obfuscating the choices we're making, and that's why I'm saying um, we may not have the right people asking those questions because I totally agree with you. Getting people on the grid means we give them access to opportunities, possibilities, finance. Um, and, and that works on the micro level, the individual level, the community level, the, the national level. And the capabilities we have are absolutely there. But digitizing those capabilities doesn't actually mean giving up the, um, the ability to be visible and invisible when you choose to, which we currently have. Because although the UK is mostly cashless, there is still optionality. And I think putting those two choices in one bucket as one choice, is you either there optionality you don't. though? Can I, can I opt out of my credit card companies you aggregating my data and selling it to third parties? No, but you can choose not to use that credit card still. Yeah, but it's, it's easy. Yeah, see? <laughs> and, and there you have it. Um, so I, actually, parts. I wanted to go, go back on. to, uh, uh, actually I have a question for you, Tony. Let's go back to that envelope analogy that you were talking about, because I think it, it goes into the financial inclusion portion as well, which is not leveraging all of these data points that we actually have and that the banks have that they aren't using. So to that, that envelope analogy, how do you think from you know, your viewpoint that, that banks can better leverage that data or how do you think they're doing like on a scale of one to ten and if they're if they're not yeah. super high how are they going to go about doing that differently because you know you you've seen this transit this transition from banks being called technology companies forever which yep. we all kind of was like your technology is so old it's like okay so data okay yeah. so let's focus on data how can they actually use that yeah uh, in a way you know james is picking up on that theme by introducing facebook and libra because of this data issue and you can see quite evidently, or I, I, I look at this and go, the UK, Europe, uh, Americas as a block have got the next you know, two, three, four years really well mapped out because it's faster, quicker, and everything else we're doing. What China is doing is data. Okay? People are there. You may or may not disagree, but it doesn't really matter. Okay? China will get there first with the data piece, being looking in the yeah. envelopes and sorting this stuff out. The issue that Europe... America have got is we want to go around this ethics debate, okay? And we want to kind of like sort out our, our ethics and our policies and everything else before we do it. But somebody's already going to have done it. So hence the reason some private companies are going, we ain't prepared to wait that long because we can see the writing on the wall. We've got to go and do it. Now, I think what Facebook have done is actually really interesting because what it's done is raised the debate and the debate is, do you need a central bank? Do you need sovereign currency? What they've actually done on page 32 is said, look, forget those because you're going to argue about it forever, but give us identity, and reality is they will win. So we've got to be tremendously careful what we ask for in the ability to open the envelope. And should we allow anybody to open the envelope? And that's the question almost of the future of money. Yeah. And are policymakers and central banks sufficiently well, how will I put this delicately? I mean, <laughs> don't. Yeah. I mean, do. James, you never put it delicately. <laughs> but I mean, it, you know, is there sufficient knowledge, experience, vision within the, the, the central banks, within the West, as, as, as you say, to really tackle these things head on? Or is everyone kind of a little bit distracted with various political crises and so on? I mean, how short term thinking? I mean, right now, we live in a world, as I mentioned, of kind of quantitative easing and negative interest rates. Yeah. Um, I mean, so, no one could have predicted that 10 years ago. So, so my fascination is, or, well, is, is, is with governance and mm. what happens with corporate governance. And to our, to, to our fundamental, 
you know, the Cadbury report of 1997, which effectively drove fraud out from our industry and massively successfully. So let's not lose what it did, but it came compliance. It came a series of tick boxes and we lost actually the boards and more people making better decisions. And so we've actually driven out the ability to make better decisions. I don't doubt the capability, but what we've done is taken away their ability to make decisions. This is why I'm so interested in, I'm not sure as a regulatory issue going forward, we've almost got to go back to 1974 where there was a different issue, which was um, uh, lots of people wouldn't take health and safety seriously. And so what the, uh, the global regulators did was, we've tried to regulate, we've tried to create this, it's become a complete mess. What we'll do is we'll send the directors to prison if somebody dies on your watch. Mm. It would, overnight, health and safety became a board issue, you couldn't delegate it, literally change. Are we going to see the same from global regulators saying it's too complicated? We can't have people in one market opening an envelope, one market not. It's, everybody's a bit confused. Do you know what? Generate a privacy policy, break the privacy policy, we'll send the director to prison. Is Europe taking a lead in this regard? In relation, like GDPR, et cetera. I mean, it's, it feels like a market internationally that is taking data seriously. Now, I'm not he's making like, this. They're not taking it as seriously, seriously as he wants them to. And there, there are some comical um, offshoots, but my, my father was in intensive care recently, and for GDPR purposes, uh, unless you filled out a whole host of non-essential paperwork before you rushed into hospital, they couldn't use your name. Yeah. Wow. Now, obviously, as he was being rushed into hospital, the, the, the papers that my, my mother focused on were the ones that were absolutely essential to his care, yeah. and she thought, I'll get to this later. We get into intensive care, he's fine, by the way. Um, we get into intensive care to see him, and it's like Mr. I, because for GDPR purposes, they can't disclose his wow. name to his doctors. So. Um, are they taking the lead? They're, t they're thinking, we are thinking about the right questions. Um, is there, uh, to Tony's point, an endemic way of ingesting regulation that is a little bit unimaginative? Yes. Does that mean this is going to be like is the same flavor with a slight twist? I don't think so. I think what I'm, what I'm seeing, definitely in Europe, but actually the world over, is a realization that these conversations have to move much faster. The pace of maturity, the pace of conversation is changing. And the realization that we have to learn a lot of new stuff from people who didn't used to be in a position to teach us. Whether we're gonna learn it fast enough, whether we're gonna make mistakes along the way remains to be seen. I think a lot of the decisions have to be made before all the data is available and before we know the full implications of things. So for me, the, the main thing that gives me comfort is the pace because we're dealing with things that are brand new to all of us, areas of knowledge that are brand new to all of us and absolute proof points that the way we used to deliver against instruction doesn't really work. So if we continue that pace of learning from new people, with new people, with the hard decisions of, and I'm not gonna go to, to your sending people to prison quite yet, although I expect we'll be hearing from you on this again. But the point you were making yesterday about teams of regulators or um, leadership teams looking at themselves going, we're not the right folks. Yes. Well, so, that's sorry, real quickly, building yeah. off of that on, on the pace thing, I think it's, it's interesting because back to the question you asked me originally on what's happening in, in Asia versus Europe versus the US, um, because you know we have four different government bodies who really have a lot of say in, in what's happening within financial services in the United States. Um, the pace has been a challenge. So Lita and I both ex-CIOs. All of these organizations are looking for CIOs. What does that actually mean? I think is still to be determined. Is it a vanity metric? Is it, are they you know, really, really trying to do that? We'll see what happens. But one thing that I have appreciated in some ways is that you know, the United States, we also have the, the, the states themselves. And so some states have tried to bypass this process because it's taking too friggin' long to yeah. do anything. States like Arizona, uh, Utah, Wyoming, who are going and creating sandboxes essentially where people can come into the market and test and have a lot of lax regulations for a period of time because they realize if we're gonna wait for this to happen at the federal level, we could be here all day, so we got to get moving. Um, and there's, a, I think, eight or nine other states who are already looking at this, and it's still to be determined what that looks like, but they're taking it into their own hands in a well, lot well, of ways and delegating. <laughs> and that's an interesting, that kind of fragmentation is interesting because I, I guess for me, one of the big considerations these days, and I agree with Lita, of course, that the pace is accelerating, but I feel like the pace of the private sector 
continues to accelerate, but I'm not sure the public sector is remotely equipped to contend with it. I mean, let's, again, back to the US. I mean, David Marcus, obviously the, the head of Libra, speaking at a congressional hearing a couple months ago. I mean, it was comical. It was farcical. I mean, clearly, you know, with all respect to US Congress people, I mean, they had no clue what they were talking about for the most, for the most part. Um, I mean, the private sector, you know, move fast and break things, innovation, we've seen it not just in the US, we've seen it in China and elsewhere. Are we, and I'm not sure who the we is in this situation, but are governments, central banks, and regulators remotely geared up for the changes that we're going to see in the next five, 10 years? And if not, what should we as an industry be doing? I think, I think they're, I think they're heading that way pretty quickly. And you know, James, in, in Asia, there's a couple of standout examples. Um, the Monetary Authority of Singapore ha has a big emphasis on this. So I think you're seeing within um, a, a, a central bank system, if you like, uh, different talent profiles, different emphasis on things that might not have been there in the past. Um, th th there's a little bit in this as well um, around, th there's a fashionable side to this and there's a practical reality side to this. The fashionable sexy side is, um, you know, new new technologies for issuing money, the cryptos. Um, if, you, if you look at, uh, we had a conversation last week, James, and I, I shared that Bitcoin's been around for 11 years now. Uh, has it really done anything in that time frame? If you look, iPhone is another year or two older than that alone, yeah, 2007. So it's a, it's a 10 year old um, thing. I, I think the iPhone is something which is profoundly changing people's lives, right? That, that's led to some profound change. So uh, it, it, it's about kind of getting to, in some ways, the reality of all this. And sometimes it's a, the flat fashionable part is, is blurred together. So you have the issuing of money, you have the processing of money, you have the servicing of money, I, t I tend to break it into those functions. I, I think people need to sort of pay attention to those different parts, improve how, how we can process to take out friction, the, the issuing side, if you can deliver to the trust and the utility and the ubiquity and the demand for receiving, the demand for exchanging, then it will, it will do its thing. But the immediate battle I, I tend to see a lot of is on that practical reality part. How do, you, how do you process more efficiently? There's work to be done there. Yep. And then these amazing ideas that are happening on the, on the servicing, so making people's lives greater, helping small businesses. We, we see businesses in Asia, they're small to medium enterprises, they're exporting around the world. All they want to do is get paid more quickly, yeah? and they want to know where the money is, when it's coming, so they can reduce their need for working capital and, and process their next order. That's, that's their focus, that's what, if you can deliver to that money, that payment proposition to them, that, that's what improves their lives. So don't get blinded by the sexy surface stuff. Actually, in the background, a lot of that infrastructure layer. It may come, right? The, the fashionable stuff may, may come, yeah? Mm. Uh, the, I, don't, I haven't seen a central bank digital currency in a live form yet, there's been a number of experiments and I think it's important to, to see that. Uh, we're not seeing uh, new cryptocurrencies at industrial type scale where you have significant demand to, to want to exchange and, and, and use those currencies. Uh, there's, there's something back to the rupee and renminbi story as well. We, we were talking about you know the role of the US dollar. You've broadly got between US and China two equivalent size economies and uh, one currency, the US dollar, sh is uh, at a share level used for about 40% of the world's payments. Mm. And you have an equivalent si sized economy in China and it's used for about 2% of the world's payments. Yeah, we track, track all of this through our renminbi tracker. Something has to give there, I think, just that the numbers are too, too broad. And it's about well, what, what happens uh, in that process such that other currencies are, are forming an equivalent role that is proportionate and commensurate with their role in the global economy and, and their size as an economy. I mean, I think, Michael, that's a, it's, a, it's an interesting point. And, and back to what we said earlier, you know, maybe we are getting a bit blinded by the technology and by the big kind of um, the new players entering the market because the future of money will be as determined by RMB internationalization than perhaps anything else. That and that's a political that business in Thailand that's exporting. Yeah, what, what yeah. does money look like to me? Okay, yeah. interesting. <laughs>
So, I mean, in terms of, are we, are we kind of talking on the wrong topic here? Is this a technology issue or is it, is it a political one? Um, I'm going to go right back to one of your early slides, sure. which is um, a collective delusion. We all believe because we believe, okay? So we all worship money because we all believe it. And how many people sit around uh, and think Thomas Cook, Nokia, Kodak, and therefore, we won't believe in innovation and we won't believe in change because we collectively believe it's all going to be okay. And if we all collectively believe it's okay, it'll all be okay. Okay? Because that's what collective belief is all about. Um, but there's two views of innovation. And one of them's called approval and one of them's called forgiveness, which we kind of like touched on. Yeah. Uh, the issue with approval is that we operate in an approval environment because we're regulated. The people we're competing it against operate in a, in a forgiveness environment. There's no real regulation. They can get away with blind murder. So we see the speed of innovation in certain markets. Someone's going to tweet that, you know. That I know they are. They're happy days. I would it, like to distance myself from these statements. No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know this man. <laughs> it's the fish swimming in the wrong way again. As you know you're alive. The, uh, the approval versus the forgiveness. And if we carry on seeking approval, we are going to carry on lagging behind. And people are going to get further and further ahead. Oh, You're say so this is like move fast I, and break things. I'm not going to disagree too no, no, much, like the, the, the killing thing maybe. But, um, <laughs> but I think, are we talking on the, on the wrong topic? From a very narrow perspective, absolutely not, right? It's what we do for a living. Servicing the exchange of value is what we all do for a living. And we know that we have technology at our disposal that allows us to do our jobs better. So to sit here every now and again and go, how is our driving and what could we and should we be doing to do better um, is, I think, absolutely essential. But what is increasingly happening is we're realizing it's not just about doing our jobs better. It's about realizing that our jobs are bigger and wider than we ever yes. had allowed ourselves to think before. Yes. Because if we are just using money as the, the sort of moniker for any exchange of value, however defined, and our job is the plumbing underneath it, then faster, better, more reliable, more robust, and secure job done. Is, is big enough a yeah. job. And the technology, as you say, keeps challenging what we can and should do. And it's, and it's a fascinating time to be doing this. But what we're seeing when we come together here is that that's no longer enough. And although yeah. that's a lot, it is absolutely not enough. It's because the, what used to be the regulatory layer, we will be told and then do what is permitted, has now become an intensely moral layer about yes. access, about permission, about fungibility. Yeah. Um, we are not sure anyone is driving that conversation to the point you're both yeah. making. And we used to think we were. We know we're not. The change is coming from a million directions, but it's mostly, to Tony's point, people giving it a go and, and following their own agenda in what is white space with cynicism, opportunism, or aspiration. We need to get faster. The regulators need to get faster. The lawmakers need to get faster because you don't want what is the most fundamental component of our social infrastructure to be de determined by accident, yes. which is yes. largely what That's is happening right now. Well, well so this Such is, so, so I, I want to kind of begin to close out by asking predictions for the next five, 10 years. But before that, I want to challenge our own ability to predict. Because, I mean, Lita, you mentioned um, six years ago, you last sat on this panel, uh, on this session. That was Singapore? Yes. I mean, what were people talking about six years ago? Because I certainly remember even being in Singapore at the time, I mean, Cybos, and frankly, the world of financial innovation and technology wasn't really talking about China at the time. I mean, obviously, Alipay and Ten Tempe existed, but they hadn't necessarily scaled. They, I mean, Bitcoin was around, but not taken remotely seriously. There was certainly no question of central bank issued digital currencies, let alone a private technology company with 1.7 whatever billion people uh, users issuing its own. So what were we talking about <laughs> five or six years ago what were we predicting five or six years hence, and how right or wrong were we? It's a very, it's a very, it's a very <laughs> good question. Um, we were, to the point I made when we started, we were having the conversation in a way that suggested we felt in control. So mm. I remember the, the, the room had been set up with us bankers on one side and the startups on the other, and it was very much a case of new entrants, new technologies, new business models. The world is beginning to change. How real is this? How robust is it? Do I want to play? Um, so the qu questions we were beginning to ask, how important is Bitcoin and is it just about the technology? How important are your new business models? Is there space in this world for both you and us? 
are you going to dictate the change? The questions were not incorrect. What was interesting was um, there was a, a divisive and confrontational tone that has gone, thankfully, that's a good thing. Um, there was a, an assumption or presumption that we will get to make certain decisions and get to bestow viability. If I like you, you get to stay. If I don't like you, we know that doesn't work that way anymore. Uh, but because there was an element of feeling in control of setting the pace and determining the conversation, nobody was really seeking to make predictions other than should I invest in this company or yes, that. Yes. And the biggest change I see, um, as I said at the beginning, is the realization that we don't control the conversation. These are bigger questions today. That's right. The technology is real robust and here to stay. And it's no more about what can you imagine, because actually we've gotten better at that as well, is what can you imagine, deliver, and remain financially viable in a world that is increasingly demanding demanding more from you in terms of both delivery and morality. And that is a new thing, and we, c we could not have predicted it was coming. I don't think anyone is self-deluded enough to not see it's here. So are we in a better place to predict? I wouldn't say so, but we're definitely in a better place to reflect. Yes. Wow, this is pretty heavy duty stuff for a Wednesday morning. But I mean, I think actually, uh, I agree, by the way, entirely. I do think five, six years ago, we were talking about Oh, banks and fintechs collaborating, and we—I mean, it was all kind of a bit. And you were a fintech. I, and I was, was a, a fintech banker at the then. time. Yeah. Well, we, we, we've collaborated very well since then, of course. But um, I think it does feel today that the questions are bigger. To your point, it does feel like there are more structural considerations we need to allow for. Um, with that in mind, I am, of course, going to ask you to predict the next five or ten years. I mean, Scarlett, maybe starting with you, and wh whether you want to think about it from a, a U.S. perspective or more generally. You know, we're back on stage here in five years' time. Can we predict? Do, will it be Libra? Will it be Central Bank? Or will it be something completely different? I think it, it will be uh, a mixture of everything that we've talked about. So I, I certainly think Libra will, will have a, a stake in, in the future. I think there's, they're going to have some pretty serious roadblocks between now and then. <laughs> um, some, some key partners have been pulling out. The banks have not been super excited about getting involved, but I do think that they will certainly play a, a very impactful role in that future. And I think I would go along with what's going to be happening at the, the macroeconomic scale, which is the gig economy. And so that's when I think about, back to the point that you're making, Michael, you're kind of talking about the small business side, but that's very much true for everyday consumers as well. And, and so however we service that group better, mm. I think that's going to reflect all the way across. Because I, I think now, I don't know if this is, I know this is for sure in the US, 40% of the population has more than one stream of income. I think that's only continue to get bigger. And so however we can help service that group uh, across the globe, and you're bringing in all these people who never had access to banking before, that's where I see the future of money going. That's a really interesting point. In fact, it may be, back to one of our earlier questions, an area where the US is going to lead is in relation to that kind of atomization of work and then how do you service all of that? Oh, super interesting. Michael. Yeah, um, I, I share some of the sentiment of Scarlett. I, I think you made a good point about the uh, following the macro trends and there, there's something of what, what I characterized as fashionable, I, I could also call it fantastical, right, that some things are getting elevated perhaps above where they really need to be, to, to deliver to the practical reality as well. Um, there are some really major macro trends going on in technology. I, I mentioned that, you know, the role of the iPhone in the last decade, that, that is a profound impact. There'll be other ones like that. Uh, the, the geographical macro reality, particularly in Asia with um, China and, and soon to be India, that, that will be uh, a, a large force being driven through the industry but the future for me is more about it's open lots of data it's really fast it's 24 7 cash is going to continue to be stripped out so there'll be more digitization and i and i think the next five years are going to be more characterized by helping solve those processing inefficiencies mm. and getting smart on the servicing of money to help improve people's individual lives or lives of small businesses or or large businesses as well Excellent. Okay, Lita, five years hence. Five years hence, I, uh, we're, we're surrounded by a lot of instability, right? Political, economic, and, and all the rest. And I, and I do think that what we define as good um, will, will be changing to reflect. So will I take a punt and say which of the companies out here will be multi-billionaires by then? No. 
but I do think that the conversation will increasingly become about access. And one of the, the values we as an industry are measured against will not just be speed, efficiency, regulatory compliance, and security, but it will also be democratization. Mm. Tony. Um, I, I think we've got to become cartographers. Um, we've reached the edge of our map. Okay, and it's actually what Leda said, we, political uncertainty, economic uncertainty, social uncertainty, and technical uncertainty. So the map we knew, we've, we've done innovation, we've done creativity, we've adapted, we've done stuff brilliantly. We, we are, as an industry, we should pat ourselves on the back. But we've reached the edge, and we don't know what goes forward. Now, if you're a pioneer, okay, what you do is you just wander into the territory and you start mapping it. Then you put down your rucksack, and then you get the, you know, you build something out, and then along comes the architects, and then comes the town planners. We're town planners, and we know what we're doing, but we don't quite know where we're going. And the issue is, our map is bounded by this very phrase, new entrance into our market, new models. No, no, that was the boundary. We've now got to go outside that boundary, mm. which is where these humanity issues come, where... Uh, the issues of responsibility and accountability come, where the issues of, re of um, re uh, programmability come. And just as an example, so I, when I was younger, I played table tennis to a very high level. Um, I played for England when I was, was very young. A man of many talents. I did not know that. Um, but my, I wasn't very good. That's the reality. <laughs> uh, but my coach sat down with me and he, he said, Tony, look, you always try to win games. And as an elite athlete, you win by the person opposite you making more mistakes. And that's a really tough lesson. Mm. You will not win by competing more. And as an industry, we try to compete. And actually, we've got to make fewer mistakes. And as we go into our mapping, we've just got to make fewer mistakes than the other guys. Mm. And that's a very different philosophy to where we come from. So the future is, actually, we've got to go chart a new map. Wow, so let me try and synthesize that in closing comments. There's a lot, lot to unpack. I mean, I guess my own micro prediction uh, is, you know, in five years' time, both at, at Cybos as part of InnoTribe and this whole industry, we are going to see a considerable amount, a considerably more interaction with and proactivity from the central banks. Because, I mean, it, is, it continues to be amazing to me that, you know, they are effectively at the heart of a lot of these big topics and big decisions. Um, but I think we're going to see a lot more engagement at an industry level. And it's happening. I mean, it's happening with Bank of England, MAS, HKMA, et cetera. But I think, you know, these are big topics that really require a coherent, joined-up approach. And it's going to have to be industry-wide. Um, so let's see how we, maybe perhaps in five years' time, we'll have a couple of regulators joining us on the stage. Until that point, um, please join me in thanking this very illustrious panel, uh, Scarlett, Michael, Lita, and Tony. Thank you very much. Thank you.